Okay, well, I want to welcome our next uh, speaker. Uh, Dr. Greg Olson is a professor in the Department of Sociology in the Faculty of Arts here at, at the University of Manitoba. Um, Greg's done uh, really important uh, work over the years on uh, the welfare state and uh, the welfare state typology, but also on uh, the, the welfare state in Sweden, which of course we always think about the Swedish welfare state model and the, the, the approach to social welfare in the Nordic countries is kind of leading the way and being uh, really interesting models for the rest of us to emulate. And there, there's a, and, and Greg's done very important and careful work on, on what's happened over the years with uh, uh, social welfare in, in, in the Nordic countries and also on kind of comparative welfare state regimes across many different countries. So I think his kind of international uh, perspective is going to be very helpful for us in thinking about basic income. So welcome, Greg. Please join me in welcoming Greg. Thanks, Jim. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me, and thank you all for coming today. Uh, I want to return uh, a bit now to what uh, Jurgen was doing at the beginning, which is talking a little bit more broadly about uh, basic income and, uh, and um, what it can do, and then looking across nationally at, at um, some different examples. Not so much of basic income, but uh, of the welfare state in relation to that. So, so first of all, just a reminder that uh, basic income isn't a brand new idea. It's existed for, the idea of it has existed for maybe almost 200 years or so. It has become popular again as it, as it does, uh, you know, it's coming sort of in and out of, of uh, style in a sense. Uh, but there are a lot of different versions of it, right? There, there's a wide range, as Jurgen uh, alluded to. There are right-wing libertarian versions, uh, like the negative income tax, associated with uh, Milton Friedman, but also Charles Murray, who co-wrote the, uh, the Bell Curve. There are centrist versions uh, supported by people like Martin Luther King and uh, no, uh, James Tobin, and there are more left-wing versions, uh, socialist versions, supported by um, Eric Owen Wright, among other people. And there, it's important to keep that in mind, right, because they're, they're very different. So as Jurgen said, what, we, what we're uh, arguing for, we want to we make sure that we're clear about um, what it is that we're we're talking about. So the the, the libertarian ones are typically ones that that are uh, talking about work incentives, right? And they're talking about m means testing, and they're often talking about basic income as a replacement for the welfare state, right? So that's a very different kind of argument and a model than uh, somebody like Philippe Van Price, who's talking about possibilities to opt out of work altogether. And it's certainly different uh, from my version or you know, vision, which is something uh, in line with uh, having a welfare state, uh, a more developed welfare state with a basic income. So to answer my, my question there, it's, it's yes. That's what we'll be getting to. OK, so I, I, again, I'll, to broaden the d discussion, the notion of basic income, we're, we're talking a lot about poverty, which is one really important um, goal or thing that we want to address. But it's also important in terms of things like reducing inequality and providing uh, greater uh, freedoms and opportunities and things like that. So I want to talk about those um, aspects as well. Okay, so uh, if you think about the basic income, again, just a quick reminder, some of the things that make, make it kind of uh, interesting and unique. The first of it is this idea of that it's universal, right? This isn't a brand new idea. Wel welfare states have universal programs, but they tend to be categorical universal, right? Everybody who's a certain age or everybody, every family's with children and so, so on. But in, in at least in some versions of the basic income idea, it's a notion that everybody, right? Every person, uh, every legal resident in a polity is entitled to this. Uh, the second thing is that it's unconditional. So it's not based on, on proving that you deserve it. Uh, being poor enough, a needs test or a means test, and it's not based upon paying into it, like a social insurance program. So it, it's unconditional in that way. I, I want to add as a side, somebody may be interested in that, that after. You know, we typically think of conditional things as, as bad. They're, they're not always bad. In some, some cases, in Sweden, for example, uh, some of the parental leave is conditional, so that you know, they want to make sure that it's shared by, by uh, both family uh, members. Uh, the last thing is that it's uniform, and again, this is something that, that di it can be different, right, from different pr uh, proposals, that, but typically we see a, a call for a kind of a flat rate, uniform, um, basic income in the progressive versions. So all of those things that allow it to address a number of different things, there are di these different goals. Again, eradicating poverty is a, a big one, an important one, uh, but also reducing inequality. 
phasing out bad jobs, right? It can work that way too if people are less dependent on their workplace, on that particular income that they have, and giving more voice to workers. Decommodification, it's a term that comes up a lot in the welfare state literature, which means t really two things, making us less dependent on employers and our jobs, but also less dependent on the marketplace. So I'll come back to that one too. And the last one, fostering greater freedom. Okay, there are some other ones too, but I don't have too much time. I think those are some of the most uh, important ones. Again, sometimes a basic income is put, put forth, particularly on the right, as a, an alternative to, to welfare states. Uh, what I would argue is that we need welfare states and we need more developed welfare states uh, for, be for basic income to work better. So I think that, that what welfare states do is allow us to extend and deepen and secure the kind of gains uh, that we can uh, achieve with, with something like a basic income program. So let me talk a little bit more then about what I mean by the welfare state. When we think of welfare state, and particularly maybe in the context of a basic income uh, discussion, we think of income measures, right? So we think of uh, a variety of income support measures uh, that are provided in Canada and other countries. So kind of basic security things like social assistance or housing allowances, which are usually means tested, and also income maintenance programs, right? Social insurance programs, which are designed not just to give you money, but to kind of uh, allow you to maintain your standard of living to some degree. But I think that there are other parts that are equally, if not more important, particularly in terms of uh, those goals that I set out there a minute ago. So one of them is, is social services. So things like child care and, and health care and elderly care and training programs and public transportation and all of those kinds of things. I think those are really, really important when we think about uh, opportunities and freedom and the, the quality of life for people uh, in a country. And the third part, which is often forgotten, is social legisla legislation. So we're thinking of protective laws here, right? Like things like uh, health and safety kinds of laws, environmental protections, corporal punishment bans, uh, all of those kinds of things. Now, of course, you know, we would, uh, we would say, yeah, we knew that these are parts of the welfare state, but I would say that they're, they're often forgotten. If you look at uh, people who are welfare state researchers, if you look at all the major models and typologies and ways of understanding the welfare state, they're, all, they're always based on income programs. How much, what kind of income programs exist, how much do they provide, how accessible are they? So I think that we miss some of these important things. And income obviously is really important, particularly in the discussion of basic income. So I want to talk a little bit about then um, what income programs have done in different countries. And I'm going to use uh, Sweden, Canada, and the US, which is kind of uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Sweden's kind of the, the relatively good anyway. So I, I don't have time for a whole lot of in inequality uh, measures here, but if you look at the income share going to the top 1%, look at the difference between the US and, and Sweden, Canada, on almost everything that I'm going to show you tends to fall in the middle, but much closer to the United States, right? So we're more like the United States. We look good and feel good about ourselves only if we compare ourselves to the United States. Oh, the, the main thing I want you to see here is look at the, this Gini. It's, uh, I don't want to get into everything about what this is about, but it's, it's a measure of inequality. It, 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 it uh, goes from zero to one. So in, in, a, in a society where one person, like let's say Jim, had all of the, well, all the income, uh, it would be a one. And in a place where it was com completely evenly split, it would be a zero. So of course, neither of those, those two situations obtain in any country. But you can see the, the before taxes in e income inequality in the three countries. They're not uh, as different as you'd think, right? I, I was surprised, I've always been surprised when I look at that. Where they really become different is after the income parts kick in, right? After the, the taxes and transfers. Okay, so if we look at uh, a class structure, you can see uh, the differences that these kind of programs can make. Um, I'll just to highlight a few things. Um, so we're looking at the bottom is the people living in poverty, the next one is the near poor, the middle class, and then the, the uh, upper class, or well-to-do. So a couple of things to, to point out just quickly. Uh, obviously, tremendous differences in, in the poverty level, and the, the 
what you see here d doesn't really get out of how real differences really are, right? Because the people in, uh, first of all, the depth of poverty is much less in Sweden. And they've had something called a social, social bidrag, which is kind of like a, a you know, a, in a, a sense, a version of, of um, a basic income, which says by law, people had to be brought up to that, that level. They had to be given this allow allowance um, to bring them up to the, the poverty level, right? If you say that uh, people can't exist uh, at a certain level, then you sh they should get that amount of income, right? That's very different than we see, for example, in the United States, right? Where if you look at the depth of poverty, something like 44% of people who are poor in the United States have less than 50% of the income that the government says that you need to survive. Uh, the, so the other thing I want to point out is the middle class. So there's quite a difference, right? And, and part of my vision of what a, a better society would look like is one where you have a, a large middle class like that, right? You get rid of the bottom and, and ideally the, a lot of the top as well, right? Maybe not all of it because we think about incentives and things like that. Okay, so uh, the, there wasn't current data for Sweden, wasn't recent data, but there was for the other Nordic countries, and you see a very similar kind of thing. Right, much lower levels of poverty and uh, larger middle class. Okay, and here again, we can just quickly look at some poverty rates. So the Nordic countries, the four on the right, poverty rates are much lower. One of the things that I'll point out to you too is if you look at the child poverty rates in the Anglo countries, right, in the U.S. and Canada, the child uh, poverty rate is actually higher than the poverty rate for the general population, which is not true in, in the, the Nordic countries. And you can also see differences in another vulnerable group if we look at single, single mother families. Okay, so, so back to this one again. So wh what, that, what we can see here is that even with the, the income programs that exist, there's still poverty. In, in Sweden, right? It's not as deep, it's not as bad, but it still, it still exists. So basic income can address that, right? At least that's, that's something that it, it can uh, contribute to. Again, it would depend so much on how, how high it is and all those kinds of uh, details that Jürgen was talking about this morning. Okay, but what I would, uh, would argue is that the social service part, the legislation too, is, is equally important, if not more important, in terms of reaching all of those kinds of uh, goals. So if you think about social services, I'll come back to this in a second. Social services, are pro think of our, of our health care or, or education at the prim uh, primary and secondary levels, right? They're provided on, on the same kind of uh, principles as basic income. This idea that it's, it's universal, and it's unconditional, and it's uniform. And so that's what we think of when we think of social services, right? Things like, uh, like health care, education, and in other countries, child care and elderly care and, and uh, a whole bunch of other kinds of things too. So those are really important in improving the quality of life for people. So uh, I can give you some anecdotal uh, stories along the way too. I've spent the last uh, 30 years or so going in Sweden and, and uh, lived there on several occasions. And I remember teaching uh, graduate courses where somebody in the class, a uh, low income single mother for example, telling me that she came to class on the way her children w were sick, stopped off to see the doctor, got the prescriptions filled, uh, dropped the children off at at uh, daycare on campus and then came to university, none of which she paid for. So when you think about freedom and, and opportunities, social services are really important, right? I mean, uh, that's a very different situation than it would be for a single mother here in Canada. So it provides these kinds of uh, freedoms and opportunities and here, you know, if you think about things like uh, women in parliament, one of the reasons that women aren't as involved in parliament in the Anglo countries is because we don't, because of a double day at work and we don't have uh, ch uh, affordable childcare, right? But if you, so if you look at other countries, it's maybe not a surprise that the countries that have the highest levels of, of, of um, females in parliament have these kind of uh, universal high quality childcare programs. Okay, so that's another kind of freedom that we can, we can think of there. Canada ranks 52nd and the United States 75th. So there are, it means that there are all kinds of countries that are poorer developing countries which do much better uh, in this area, right? So it's not simply a matter of being a wealthy country. Okay, some of the other goals that basic, in basic income can, can um, 
uh, address. So th this is the one I just talked about, freedom, and I just want to emphasize that there's a different, different ways of thinking of freedom from, right? So in, in the Nordic countries, the idea of freedom from is from in the sense of encouraged by, right? The way a gift can be from me to you. The state can encourage, can foster freedom. So if it has these kind of social programs in place, it can do that, right? As, as the examples that I, I just gave. In the Anglo countries, we ha tend to have a more of a notion of freedom from in the sense of the state has to be kept away there. It's bad, right? We should be free from state intervention, from state interference. Okay, the uh, basic income can also play a role in improving the workplace, right? If, if the basic income is high enough, people don't have to accept bad jobs, mind-numbing kind of, you know, jobs that, that are, are, aren't good for our health and so on, right? But I want to point out that social, service can, social services can do that too. And again, uh, somewhat anecdotally, if you look at um, Volvo in Sweden, uh, when I was there in the, in the 1980s, uh, this, ca this car factory had one of the highest turnover rates in, in the world because people, people weren't staying there. They didn't want to do these jobs. And I, I have experience there. I worked in, in uh, Chrysler uh, when I grew up in Windsor. And you do these kind of mind-numbing jobs where you're tightening a bolt or turning a screw over and over and over again, right? And the, basically what people were saying is, I don't have to do that, right? I'm, I'm not going to spend my life turning a screw. I can go to university, right, which is... is part of the social services that are provided. Uh, there's childcare for my children, there's health care. I don't have to worry about all those kind of things. So it really provides a, a, a tremendous amount of freedom. That put the pressure where it should be. It put the pressure on the employers to change the nature of the workplace, right? So they introduced, they had all these tailorist jobs and then they introduced work teams and got rid of the assembly line. It's interesting because if you look at, at the Volvo plants, anywhere else in the world, they didn't do that. They only did in Sweden where these conditions uh, in a sense, force them to do that, right? Okay, the, the, the next point is decommodification. Again, this is this idea that we, uh, in a capitalist society, we become very, very dependent, right? We don't have the means of subsistence or the means to take care of ourselves, uh, so we're dependent on our jobs and our employer, but we're also very dependent on the marketplace. So b what basic income does is it kind of weakens that decommodification in terms of your dependence on the job or on, on the particular employer, right? Because if you're, you're guaranteed a certain amount of income, it provides you with some more freedom to think about going somewhere else. However, what it doesn't do is, is uh, end decommodification on you know, the dependence on the market. In fact, it increases that, right? The more we're reliant on income, the more we're, we have to buy these things. And that, that's n not a very good thing, I would say. We want to be de decommodified in, in both senses, right? And that's what social services do. So universal social services allow us to be decommodified where it really matters in areas like, like health care and elderly care and child care and all of those kinds of really important things, right? I can't imagine that a basic income could ever be high enough to, to pay for those kinds of things. You know, I know I've known uh, just in the last four or five years, I've got uh, something like 16 friends who've, who've, uh, who have cancer. And any one of them, they're middle class people, would be bankrupted by having, you know, if they had to pay for those things. A, a basic income is not going not gonna to address that, right? There are a whole bunch of things that it won't address. So we really need these kind of uh, social services. And, and uh, you know, there are lots of examples of, of that everybody knows, uh, particularly in Canada, of horror, st horror stories from the United States if we rel rely on the marketplace, right? Because the, the marketplace kinds of provisions like that are structurally uh, dis predisposed to, to getting profits, right? And they do what they need to do to, to survive and, and to become very profitable. And it's not just like in the, in the United States. In the last, uh, last time I was in Sweden, they've, you know, they've been experimenting with them. Um, private provision of, of um, elderly care and health care and, and things like that. It's, it's a real disaster. Education as well. So uh, some big American uh, and British companies came in and, and took over some, some elderly care uh, centers, for example. And the first thing they did was they told the managers as a great big bonus and a trip for whoever cuts costs th the quickest, right? So what do you think they did, right? They stopped changing beds as often. They stopped changing diapers as often. They stopped giving them medicine that they needed, right? Because everybody wanted to... to to win, and the, the companies uh, wanted to to profit. Okay, the same thing. I give lots of other examples. The same thing has happened in the uh, area of education, 
where the privatization of some some schools and even kind of um, almost kind of high schools. Okay, so here's another example. Housing is obviously a really important thing for, for uh, that we want to uh, address. And you, again, you can't do that without social services. So the country I've been looking at homelessness for the last uh, four or five years, and the country that by far has done the best is, uh, is Finland. And it's done this by, by really promoting this idea of housing first, which I, I'm sure everybody here is familiar with. And so you actually see the rates really going down quite significantly in Finland. In other places, we talk about how important it is, but the rates have actually gone up, right? Okay, so the obstacles. Um, I don't have to go into too much detail because I think that uh, Jürgen uh, covered that pretty well this morning. But I will, I will mention a, a few of them, right? So obviously, the, one of them is the, the, you know, how much are people ready to endorse these kinds of things, right? And and uh, I, I think that uh, some of the, the data, at least, is is a little bit more controversial than maybe you're going to thought. I mean, there are, there are lots and lots of studies which show that when, when programs are universal, they're the most popular ones, right? So even in the United States, right, the place that's anti-state, that's anti-welfare state, the most popular programs are the things like Social Security, the ones where everybody or almost everybody is included. In Canada, health care, right? So I think that's an important thing for us to us to keep in mind. Having said that, I would want to be naive about this. There are all kinds of things that, that all kinds of obstacles that we would we would um, face, right? Which we have to uh, face up to and address. So economic uh, issues and, and political ones. For me, some of the things that make basic income so interesting are the things that would make some other people, at least, perhaps a bit, uh, other c uh, corporations, not happy, right? The idea that, that uh, workers become more empowered or less dependent, right? That can be made to work, but it, it, it's not something that is, is uh, you know, necessarily something that's going to be uh, embraced and applauded, right? Because the basic income can work something like a strike fund. It can give workers more, uh, more power, right? It, it can actually strengthen the labor movement. And what we've seen in the last few few decades is is uh, corporations trying to escape. Then, right? So I've I've spent a lot a lot of time uh, when, apart from my home city, wherever that is. I spent a lot of time in Stockholm, and I spent an, also spent a lot of time in Detroit. And those are two very different kinds of cities, right? And and really, Detroit is in the shape that it's in for to a large part because uh, big auto industries and and supplier industries have been leaving quickly and and setting up elsewhere, where they don't have to pay. Uh, where they can pay lower taxes and they don't have to pay into to, uh, benefit programs and all of, the, all of those things. None of that is to say that we, sh we shouldn't fight for these things. I think they're, they're really important and, and uh, we need to do it we need to do it now and, and, and keep doing it. And, and um, I think the idea of, of universality and the solidarity it can, can create are uh, sort of our, our foundation or our starting point. I'll stop there. <laughs>